Good morning, class. Thank you very much for convening with us this morning. And we will continue from where we left off last week. It's been a great week so far, and I trust that you are doing very well. Um, what we'll do today is to continue from the sections that we're looking into in case study. Last time we met, we discussed qualitative research, and then we tried to discuss um, the different types of qualitative research. We rounded up with a case study <clears throat> as one of the qualitative research strategies or types, and we were discussing, um, we defined qualitative uh, case study, then we looked at some examples of case study. We also went ahead to try to look into some of the ways of developing a, a case study. So what we'll do today is to continue from where we left off. We define the case study as a study of a bounded system, which draws data from multiple sources, observations, interviews, audiovisual materials and documents. Today we'll do our best to look at some of the different data sources. And I'm hoping that I can cover some other things that may be relevant to students to, in considering what they are will be they'll be doing in their research okay case study tends to matter when um, a student or a researcher has to do a microscopic evaluation of a, an issue in which he has less control of and especially takes place within real life context and then or natural settings and it offers that researcher the opportunity to test some of the prevailing assumptions or theoretical positions or ideas in order to refine knowledge so through a case study, somebody gets an opportunity or a researcher gets an opportunity to test existing knowledge within um, a bounded system. The bounded system can be bounded by time, people, location, uh, activity, even uh, or even by organization. Okay. We talked about the different types of case studies and then we looked at exploratory, descriptive, and then uh, explanatory. Then we went on to try to discuss different, uh, the, the kind of multiplicity of case studies. So sometimes somebody does a research, he does a single case, which may be focused on a, an extreme issue that he wants to confirm and challenge a theory. Others also like to do a multiple case, which gives an opportunity to compare one case with the other in order, in order to find more reliability to some of the, and enhance the, the, the validity of the conclusions especially with some of the phenomenon that they are studying. If it occurs in diverse manner in society, people like to do double, uh, multiple cases so that they can embrace different views about the issue and then be able to analyze and find out what is really letting this thing work in a particular way. So it's good to consider multiple cases if you can afford it, you can afford it. We also talked about the different types of developing a case, the different approaches the four-step approach and the semester approach. I think one thing I would advise your students is that you can use any of the approaches, but the semester approach just gives you more detail of what you're supposed to do. Every good case study will begin with a research question and you, the author will then go on to define the type of study he wants to carry out. And then you go on to look at um, the participant that will have to participate in the study. That will mean that defining your boundary and then you go to collect your data, you analyze your data, you write your report, and you ensure validity and reliability. Okay. So collecting data, we talked about different factors that influence collection of data. One of, being, one of the factors being that your research gaps, research papers, research objectives and questions, that means that those things that will go into the data collection process would actually influence the data collection process. If you look at your research gaps, it will inform your purpose and your objectives, and then to also inform your questions. Your research questions will then also inform your theory and then your research questionnaire. So when you go to the field, you have a questionnaire that you're going to employ and use to collect data. Now, when you use this particular um, questionnaire, the questions that you have on it has to capture the different uh, sections of your research framework or your conceptual framework in order to collect data to be able to answer those, uh, study the variables in the relationship with, within the conceptual framework. So any good questionnaire that you, you create should have the different sections like the 
um, main questions, the other questions, the demographics, and then the conclusion. Um, other things that come up in terms of influencing your study is the, we mentioned the research theory that will inform your research questionnaire. And then I showed you an example of um, how a, res a research theory or a research set of research questions actually structures the outcome of a case study. This is an outcome of a case study, that's the case report or the, the write-up of the case itself. The part, the upper part of the case, and the first part, introductory part of the case, is much more about introducing you to the natural settings, which is because we said case study is a qualitative research approach, which actually lends the researcher or affords the researcher the opportunity to do research within the natural settings concerning a contemporary phenomenon in which he has less control about. So if you look at it, this is going to, this is just the natural settings. You cannot strip the natural settings away from the phenomenon you are going to study because the phenomenon you are studying itself is in, embedded in a social, historical, temporally or transitory context. That means that it's in an environment that is socially constructed and it's also in an environment in which ideas are con is dynamic, ideas are constantly evolving. So you can't actually just strip the data and the case is the phenomenon you want to study from the natural settings. The natural settings can enhance your understanding of why the phenomenon is occurring in this particular way. Okay. And I gave an example that when we read about grace and we mentioned that grace is able to send simple text messages, it's because at the end of the day, we should believe that grace has got some level of education that can help her understand that. Either she's been taught by her friends or she has going some level of education. For example, here's, here she it says that she has a primary school level of education and has learned the trade from her mother. So I'm able to send text messages to inform customers, tells you that there is a premise, there is a logical chain of evidence to substantiate this particular argument. And the argument is stemming from the fact that she has some level of education. Okay. So we went on to say that how do people structure their cases? And we said that every good case should start from the natural settings. Tell us where the thing is occurring. That is what you see in the previous slide. So that would be the firm profile or the background of the firm or the institution that you are trying to study or the settings in which the issue is taking place. The next thing that you go into is the phenomenon you are trying to study, the phenomenon. The natural settings can have several phenomena and the, the, the one you choose to study is the one that will be your focus. So in the natural settings of a market, there could be um, and the structure of the market, there could be um, how taxi drivers and other people work in the market, and then the sanitation in the market, policing in the market, there could be um, um, so many dimensions of issues I could study, I, my, just minors using mobiles in, in the market. So when I make up my mind, I want to study how market women or market traders use mobile phones in their micro trading businesses, then it becomes the phenomenon I've, cho I've chosen. So in the marketplace, the, so I will, in the first part, I will describe the marketplace here. Then I'm going to the phenomenon or the person that I'm trying to study is the firm or enterprise here. And I'm going to the phenomenon I want to study, particularly in this, in this particular section, the second one. Then after giving the background of the phenomenon I want to study, I then start discussing the phenomenon and its occurrence or what concerns the phenomenon within the given context or participants that I'm doing my interview with or doing my study on. Okay, so it means I have to capture issues that concerns the phenomenon, explore concerns, describe events, quotations from re respondents, constraints and challenges, outcome and impact, and then a future outlook. Okay. So if you are starting from a, a firm, if I do a firm-based case study, we expect you that at the beginning, you should give us some background on the firm who the firm, what the firm is, how the firm works, the structure, resources, achievement, and financial performance. Now this one, you give us as much information that can be relevant in doing, in, in understanding the case as we go on. If it will not be relevant for us to um, understand the case, if, if finances of the company or achievements of the company is not relevant, and understanding the phenomenon we want to study, then there's no need for you to cover it. You, you go, you, you put in information concerning the firm profile in relation to the type of study that you are doing. So if you look at um, our example earlier, that one was just giving us a very simple preamble of what a woman does and then how she began 
um, how she began her business and then the information about the the level of education she has that gives is enough sufficient information for you to go on and then do much more analysis of the findings of the phenomenon itself however when we look at the other paper that we we're discussing last week that's um it's a second paper that has to do with let me just show you e-commerce capabilities of a Ghanaian retailer okay used car retailer now what you see here is the firm profile after the firm profile the author scrolls down and um, goes to the business resource development. That's how the firm began, or the background to the phenomenon. The phenomenon we are trying to study is about how the firm sells cars online. And then it gives you the business startup, finding the first supplier, find, making the first pitches, all this is explained. Then from there, it goes to the phenomenon of study. The phenomenon of study is e-commerce capabilities development. So how do they develop capability to sell online? Then he starts with a historical account on the first capability that was built, informational capability. Now you can see conversations here in terms of text um, actual quotations from the film. If we look into your case study and we don't see actual quotations from the persons that you are doing the interview with or you are doing the study on, it doesn't help us to we, uh, appreciate that you were on the phone and collected data from these people. So, we always ask that anytime you are doing a case study, we want the real world accounts captured and, and, and featured. And the only way you can show that real world accounts are captured and featured is to occasionally bring in quotations for some of the respondents and participants who participated in the study. We don't just want to just a long story. We want you to see actual people saying certain things, giving recommendations. Yeah. So you see this one, this one is an example of such quotation. Occasionally, as you read through the paper, you see another one. This is another one that's come up. So they are actually, they are within the work. Then goes to a second type of capability develop. You see another quotation here. Then um, it goes on, another quotation here. Then it goes on again to the third, um, to the last type of capability, and then to the challenges they were facing as a company. So addressing payment requirements and addressing business competition. So there's another quotation here. So and before the conclusion of the case. So what you see here is that throughout a case, if you want to do a very uh, do a very good work, you want to make sure that you have um, the case based teams, the case based in, uh, case based teams quotations from respondents, all of them captured. Now let's get into another section of the case study that we are trying to do. Now, when you are writing a case, you need to collect data. The, case, the data you are going to collect is going to come from different people. So there's a need to establish boundaries. And what do you mean by boundaries? If I'm doing my study, I need to define how far I'm going to um, collect data from my respondents and which respondents qualify to be in my study. So there are different categories of respondents. There are respondents that have a direct knowledge or experience concerning the phenomenon of study. They have experiences themselves, they have direct knowledge. So for example, if you are studying micro, micro trading and mobile phones, somebody who have a direct experience is the market to man herself. So that would be a, one person that you should consider for direct experience of what or the knowledge about using the mobiles in the business. And that person that could also be direct, can have a direct interaction, could be the customers who are or the clients of the, of the lady, and then even sometimes some of the trading partners. Could they do direct, they use the, the employee of, mobile phone directly in the business and they are engaging with the owner of the business through the mobile phone. So these are direct knowledge and experience. Then you can go to um, another set of people who have indirect knowledge and experience. Now indirect knowledge and experience come from those who are not the first hand in experiencing the issue but they may have heard about certain things or they may have reported accounts about how people are benefiting from whatever phenomenon or whatever people's experiences are. So it could be people who are a little bit of not engaged in the phenomenon that you want to study, but they may know certain things about it. For example, if I'm doing a study on the, this same micro trading and mobile phones, and I'm discussing with a particular trader. Now, if the trader finds herself in a marketplace and there's a market association, 
and she's not a member of the market association a, a, a member of the market association leadership but she's a member of the market association now if i intend to go and discuss uh, have a discussion with the market queen now in that in such a scenario i'm talking to somebody who has not a direct knowledge and experience of using mobile phones to do business in the woman's business but has an understanding a general understanding of what has been going on in the market so i can be able to gain information from that person and that person becomes somebody who is indirect knowledge or experience concerning the phenomenon of study concerning the phenomenon of study then there are those who are external to the experience for example a bank in case the market woman is saving a particular bank and the bank sends people to come and collect money from the market woman daily at the marketplace that bank is an external has is external to the experience of the market woman she might not be there directly but they, they might not even be there as often they only come there to just come and collect information um, or come and collect money from them so in, uh, in towards their own towards their savings so in that in such a scenario those people are external to the experience then lastly there are those who are cross boundary internal and external now that's a very complex kind of um, a respondent to find one of them could be somebody for example who is um, um, like a trading partner who in, indirectly is not is not directly involved in your company but also sits outside but that's certain things that actually influences the way you do you do your, you do your business for example you could have um, a, a very simple one could be someone like a taxi driver who actually helps the, uh, the market women to come to the market by bringing the driving them there and driving them out or helps them to do deliveries and that person may not sit in your company but actually the, he interfaces your company with an, an other other external partners and other external uh, respondents or other externals and stakeholders so uh, a delivery a delivery person could be one um uh, a taxi driver that uh, supports your business could be one they are not part of your business they have their own business they are external but they have services that tend you tend to benefit from and those services actually also can either constrain or enable some of the other things that you do but they are not part you don't pay them you don't you, you don't pay them as salaried workers but they do certain things they offer services that you you tend to need you tend to need so those ones could be considered as cross boundary they are external and internal at the same time they are external to your company but they have certain things that they do that are internally relevant to your company okay now in the same way the bank that i said that the banks are external to the experience depending on the type of banking facility a person has obtained and the relationship between the bankers the bankers can become a cross boundary responder now i'm not saying that go there and be looking for who is the cross boundary respondent who is the uh who is the uh indirect in, in responder i'm just trying to let you understand that there are different types of respondents so if all your respondents are just the knowledge those who have got direct knowledge or experience you may have a narrow view of the data you're collecting or the phenomenon you're studying then you have got other type of respondents who are time bound when we say time bound it means that if you are, i'll answer your question it, when you say time bound it means that um, they are maybe time related for example if in interviewing somebody you realize that the person has some customers who are who are very good but those customers are not are no longer accessible to the person for example maybe i'm a barber and i do barbering and you're doing, you're doing an interview with me and i tell you that oh when i used to be located at tesano i used to have 20 of customers who are from parliament from this and this when I, right now i moved to legon i don't have those customers anymore but if you want to know about how i began my business some of those people can give you some information now in that scenario you, you realize that because of the time that they interacted with that particular respondent those people that you may want to go and interview through snowball what i mean by snowball they are referring to you, those people those people you may go we want to go and interview they are no longer part of the current happenings in the organization of the, the barber's work but they are part of the I want to the barber started his business so you need to appreciate that there could be certain people who are who, uh, who have intimate knowledge about the respondent or the phenomenon 
but are not in terms of the time that you are carrying your study, are not within the same timeline. So then you have done something in the past, and you need to have to go to the past to, if you want to get them, then you're going to ask them questions based on certain things that happened in the past. But if your study is not concerned, uh, concerns that, doesn't concern that, then it means that they are not part of your work. So they, are, they could be time related in terms of the time in which they interacted with the phenomenon. And if the time is in the past, you may need to, and you still need to collect the data from them. You should know that they have been time bound. You have to go to them and collect data concerning the phenomenon, the, the, the experiences of the phenomenon in the past. Then there are those who are also event-based. Event-based meaning that you can only, you are, you are accessible to you because an event has happened. And not because of the fact that it, under normal circumstances, you could have had access to, um, to them. So some, let, let me give an example that somebody is carrying out a study in which, sorry, um, somebody is carrying out a study in which he, he or she is supposed to um, collect data from about people who visit Accra Mall. Now, if you go to Accra Mall on a normal day, you get a type of people you can interview. However, if it is a holiday, you go to a cramo, or if it is a, a weekend, you go to a cramo, that timing of that timing, that is one, and that particular set of events that are taking place in a cramo can attract a different type of audience. So if that event doesn't take place or that timing is not available, you may realize that you may not be able to have access to those kind of people. So in case um, there is a, 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 a program, maybe, a, a musical event taking place in Accra Mall, certain type of people will be attracted to come there. If there's a day you're collecting data, those people are just there because of the event, and the event is what has made them available uh, available to you. Now, if you're not very careful, if you think that is a normal, is a norm of they being there all the time, it could actually skew your data collection. That you may collect data, uh, and the data will reflect what could be uh, um, um, out of the norm. And what if you want to study what is normal, then you have to go to the time the place is in its natural settings. But on that particular day, if it's not that your, if that's not your focus, your, your data could be skewed by those who actually are not part of the norm of coming to the Accra Mall on weekends. They just show that because of the musical event. So events itself can actually create a type of audience for you. And they could be helpful or they could be not be helpful to your work, depending on your objective and the purpose of your study. Okay. Then the last, the other types of people, uh, responders, which are transitional. Transitional meaning that they don't have consistent experience in the issue. So let me just give you, you go to the hospital and then you want to do interviews with patients. Now somebody is there, not because of you. He's come there for, uh, uh, to, for a procedure. After the procedure, he's leaving and going. So they just pass through. So they are not necessarily part of the, you may not get them all the time. And it means that even following up and collecting data from them may be difficult. Because in terms of a phenomenon that you are trying to study in that hospital, those people pass through each and every day. So they are not necessarily the, the people that you can just sequest and just interview. There's a difference if you are doing a study and you realize that you have an access to a, maybe a list of people from the hospital and you can call them and do the study on. That one is different. But if you just want to do random selection and just show up in the hospital and you are carrying out your data, you go to hall by ward. it depends on who is there at that particular point in time. So there are people who are transitional in, in the past through it. They may not necessarily be permanent people that you can always have access to them. You have to note that they may be passing through they are only accessible to you at specific times, not at all times. Now, this is different from the event. The event is defined by an event. The transitional may not necessarily be defined by an event. They just, there are people who are, could be accessible to you today, but they will not be accessible to you tomorrow. So that could also be, be something that could, okay. Now, it happens a lot even in doing studies in institutional context. Like you go to a class, you want to do an interview. You have a sampling frame that there are 38 students there. I go there today, there are 32 students. The next time you come back, there are 37. Another time you come back, there are 33. 
So you realize that it's very difficult for you to get all the members if you're not very careful and you don't intentionally interfere with the natural settings that everybody should be there and you want to do your work. So in that scenario, there could be others who, there could be certain respondents who just may not be showing up at all the time and they may not be the people who will be accessible to you. So transitional means that the, trans, the transitional respondents are best out of a, a transitional setting. The setting itself is not a very relatively stable one. People go through and come through. Okay. Then you also have snowball respondent. A snowball respondent means that I'm interview Kojo and on let's say on people who use Range Rover. And Kojo then refers me to another person who uses Range Rover, Range Rover as a car. But what am I doing? I realized that Kojo is now referring me to somebody else. And that is a snowball because a snowball sampling is a multi-stage sampling in which it works through um, a referral system. So the first one you may have, have either use purposive sampling or random sampling to locate Kojo. After you talk to Kojo, Kojo now points you to the next person that you should talk because he knows and the person also uses what you're looking for. And the person also recommends another person to you. Then it becomes, you are in a whole snowball uh, uh, phenomenon, um, snowball sampling approach in which people are referring you to the potential client, the potential respondents of your study. Okay. So let me look at the questions that you had here. Mm -hmm. So he says, first of all, if you say, can you kindly give another example for those who are external to experience? Oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Now, it, all of these things are, are fluid explanations depending on somebody's study. Somebody, what is external to, somebody, to somebody's study may be internal to someone's study. Mm -hmm. So let me just give an example. In my PhD, when I was doing my study, I was, I was actually doing a study on um, how Ghanaian firms use internet to do their business. So one of the firms, one of the studies I did was on this used car retailer that we're looking at. Now, the used car retailer business was founded by John. Good. Now, John founded the, the business and then he has, John used to import the cars from Germany. Like from a guy called Braun. So Braun used to talk to John a lot on email. Now, because email is part of internet applications, John is somebody who has direct experience with the issue that I'm trying to study. Now, if I'm trying to look into how cars were shipped from the US and brought to Ghana, Braun is also a direct experience because it was he who go to the harbor in Germany and then um, um, and put the car on the ships and the car will come to Ghana. So Braun had a direct experience to the issue. However, the same Braun, if I'm looking into phenomena like, if it, my study was more about customer service in used car retailers, and I'm looking at how Ghanaians perceive uh, buying cars through the internet, in that scenario, Braun then becomes an external to the because he's now a supplier to the Ghanaian cars here. I'm not concerned about his supply business. I'm concerned about how Ghanaians perceive in Ghana their customer service they receive from these companies. So Braun then becomes an external person in that type of study. But in the previous study that I was looking about using internet for business, primarily looking at how the cars are found and shipped to Ghana, Braun is, was a direct experience person. But now that more about customer, customer service and perception of customer service in buying cars online, then I'm now more concerned about a different type of, I have a different focus. So in this scenario, the study, in this scenario, in this type of study, the same one then becomes what? Becomes an indirect person, an external, sorry, an, an external, uh, external to the experience. It's now someone who is quite external to the experience here. He doesn't know what is happening, how I market my team to my customers here. That's, that's quite different. Okay, now, in that same type of study, somebody who said that somebody who has indirect knowledge or experience. Now, indirect knowledge or experience can come from a board of director, directors of John's company who may not be intimate, not have intimate knowledge of the act going to the harbor, bringing the cars, going to negotiate with customers. But that person has maybe 
a general knowledge of which is reported by, by John to him. So at the end of every board meeting, tell you that this is how many cars we sold, this is what we did, this is what we did. So now these board members then have an indirect experience of what John is doing. They were not part, they are in the company, but they are not part of the indirect engagement with customers and with Braun in buying the cars. Okay. So I hope if you are, is that, is that perfect? Is that clear now? So Tio, you're asking me that, how do you consider Guru Boys, external or indirect experience? What are you studying? What is external to somebody is what is direct to somebody. So I can't, I can't answer to you, I can't answer the question if I don't know what you are studying. Because what you are studying, I can carry out a research. In that type of research, the, 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 the VC can be a direct experience to my type of study. Another type of study, the, the VC could be a cross boundary. Another type of study, the, the VC could be external or indirect. So please, what you are doing is what defines the classification that you give to the person. Okay, so if you ask the national service, um, Richard, you're asking the national service personnel in the organization. I can't tell what the, what to the, what, in what type of study. So the type of study will tell me who, who that person is and what that person is. Okay, but in your, in your study, in your um, long essay, nobody is going to ask you that, define whether this guy is direct, indirect, or, or external or internal. I'm using that one to guide you in your thing, in your ability to select your respondents. And let me give you an example of somebody who did it in a study. So this person is doing a study on mobile learning in Ghanaian institutions. To be able to do that, she has done a sample from, she has done a sample from um, four organizations, two of them being public universities and two of them being private universities. So are the are the so in the three categories of people he wants to interview, administrators, lecturers, and then students. Now, if you look at it very carefully, the ones that he had almost everybody being filled up to interview are those are the ones which are direct. So the students and then the lecturers are direct. So he tried to make sure that six 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 six. Okay. Now the timetable developer. It's not a direct experience of what you are trying to do in mobile learning. He doesn't learn through mobiles, but he provides a timetable that maybe the he may be, he provides a time uh, a timetable that may be relevant to the type of study that you are carrying um, 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 uh, car, um, carrying out. So, but it might not be part of the learning. So, somebody in in such a scenario for somebody. A timetable developer could be an indirect experience because he's developing content for you. And you need to give you give you a, a report on what you are doing, how many firm, firm courses you are going to run, and so they can develop a timetable for you. Technical support can, are direct people who are having a um, direct relationship to the data because they to the study, because they are creating the platform for the internet and for the mobile learning to take place. Then you also have systems administrator. The system network administrator will be at a small senior level. So you may be at an indirect, have an indirect experience to it. Content developer, turning content to make it relevant. To, yeah, it depends on whether the content is developed internally or externally. For the public sector institution, they are developed internally. So somebody can say that they are either direct or indirect, but they are actually part of the organization. However, in some, in the other institutions, the, the private institution, the PVTI, PVT1, PVT2, they don't even have the content developer. The program coordinator level, you have one, 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 one. Program coordinator coordinates the program. Those are the people who are actually going to be looking and assessing the people who are doing the study. Now, a program coordinator in terms of mobile learning, it's, it can be um, an in, can be either an indirect person or an external to the uh, to the phenomenon, depending on how you define the program coordinator, how you use it in your work. Okay. Now the institutional leader is external. That one is far external. So you, you see that one, you could only get two lead two. So.
Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Is it better now? Because I'm using this particular screen. Okay. Um, Philip, is it better now? You are saying that uh, my our uh, right hand of the screen is covered by our names, preventing a full view of your screen. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. I I, I don't see it yet. I don't see the similar thing as you are seeing. So thank you very much. Okay. So let's continue. So what we are emphasizing here is that there are different levels in the type of book you collect data for, and you should know the boundary, how far you go. Because sometimes you can also get wrapped into this, getting more data, getting more data, and you may not end up collecting all the, uh, finishing the data collection process. Data collection is usually finished when you realize that you have reached a point of data saturation or theoretical saturation. Any, any, any further data you collect is not different from what the other people, the other respondents or previous respondents have told you. So you realize that there's no much to be, no new things to be learned in that scenario, and you just go ahead. You go ahead and move away from the data collection and go to the uh, start analysis. Okay, so um, it will be your welcome. Now, in the quality, in the qualitative research, the person who is doing the study uses multiple sources of data, documentation, um, and reports. The documentation can be public or private. So you have to keep that in mind. Then there's direct observation. Then there's archival rec records, those which have been archi um, archived. Then there's interview and focus group discussions. There's physical product examination or artifact examination by looking at a product and looking at it yourself. For example, if you are selling cars, you may have to examine the cars yourself. If you are um, um, doing your study on, a, on, which is based on a website, you have to do artifact examination on the website, looking at, uh, looking at that device, the, the website itself, and then describing the website, giving the different features of the website. Okay. So let's look at examples. So in this one, we collected data. We collected some quant quantitative data, even in this qualitative study, to be able to get an idea of um, certain information that can enhance the study. For well, in the first one, we're looking at the cost of mobile handsets as used by the traders, which is the mobile marketing trading paper. The second one, we're looking at um, the company that is selling cars online and how much they made over 2004 to 2007. So this information prints a summary of some of the things that could have, was happening in the organization. And because the cars were being sold online, it also there was a necessity for us to do an activated examination where we describe the website. So there are different locations. If you look at the paper, there are different sections in which I describe the website and how many people visited the website, give statistics about the website. Okay. Then sometimes you can also use logic and process models to actually um, illustrate your data. So you are talking about somebody selling cars online. How does he sell it? So you start from customers make contact with the firm. This is usually through referral, advert to local paper. It goes to your website or it goes to directly to the manager. It goes to your manager. The manager sends it, puts it on the, um, may look at the website too and look at the information that's coming through the website and compare the both. The manager then sends the information um, concerning what you have seen, what the request has made by the customer into a, a, a stage of negotiation. So the manager will collect, contact the, Niger, the German partner to ascertain whether the cars are, the type of cars being requested or the cars being desired is available. Now, on availability of the choice car and the price, uh, and the price goes back to the pro uh, process one. So if the car is not available, the person has to go backwards and then start the whole process again or go and look for a car that will be available and accessible to them. Now, if there's negotiation on the car and the choice, the, the car of choice and price is well accepted, then it goes to payment terms. And if you, if you are doing the payment, you can do pre-financing option or you can do payment by cash. So I was just sh we showing the different ways in which these things happen. So process, the process models and logic models can be used to enhance data understanding or data to display data to you to enhance the understanding of the person who is reading your work. So if you are doing your work, you can use 
collect data and use diagrams, you can use different forms of illustrations to make it easy for people to appreciate. There was a case study I was doing, I was writing a paper, and I was encouraged to show, I was talking about market, markets in Nigeria, and I was encouraged to show how far, how displaced the markets are. So I needed to show that one on the map and then circle them, those ones out. And one of the case studies I had was, uh, was on tomato sales in Nigeria. So I need to also show that one. Okay, they also need direct quotes from customers in your case study. A case study should have direct quotes from customers. Like Auntie Akosia will find that Grace mentions that these are direct quotes from customers. We expect you to have it within the case that you have, you are developing. Okay. Now the direct quotes help to help us to understand what you are trying to do. And the direct quote should not just come from the owners of the of the uh, of those who experience the phenomenon. It can come from the other external uh, stakeholders too, or people who are not or other respondents. It can come from any other respondent apart from um, just the owner of the or the founder of the institution or the firm that you are trying to do the study in. Okay. Now, every good study, case study, before this case study is done, the person should have a case study protocol. That tells us what you're going to do, how you're going to do it, your sampling procedure, your case study questionnaire, your collection, data collection methods and skills required, and a guide for the study report. Now, when you go to the, after that, after the person has finished, then develop the case study database. That's the way of organizing and documenting the data collected. So that when you write your case study notes, your case study documents, tabular ma materials, statistics survey, and then quantitative data narratives as open-ended questions, and they are capturing of the quotations from them into, into the main work of writing a report. So you are going to have the narratives of the people captured, and then the list of, sorry, the list of, okay, a list of respondents by their role or function, or the um, and then the, then the case study report. Now, all of these, if you do it very well, it increases the validity of your reliability of your research. Now, let me just show you. Some of you say that, Prof, you this thing you're talking about, are you sure you have been doing it? Oh, I mean, I, I do it a lot. And sometimes, in the if you look at my uh, my works that I've, I've published, especially my my theses. That's my PhD thesis and other ones. You realize that at the end of the, let me try and open it for you. At the end of the PhD work, I have some of these things um, outlined very on there for you to read to learn from. Okay, so just give me a second. Let me share what I'm talking about with you. So somebody finishes a study, we'd like to know how the study was done. So look at this. Look at this one. Um, so I should minimize this. Okay, please look at this one. So the firm background, you see this is the case profiling. When I collected the data for this is how I use it to be able to develop the case that you saw. The firm background mission, I collected all this information. The e-commerce evolution, how it started, and the factors I was looking into, and then how they developed it, and then the managing resources and constraints and capabilities, and future developments. Now, if you look at it, this is how I did my interviews. Okay, semi structured interview, internal. Now, can you now see it? Internal. <laughs> internal, external. So, this one I'm just doing, even doing internal and external. Interview objectives. What do, who will be interviewing the objective of the per, interviewing the person? Then, look at it artifact functionality. If I'm studying the person's website, what am I looking out for? Website interface, navigation. Uh, information content, commercial information, transaction, 
interaction, supplier connection, then the function, and then, uh, then there's a technical email. Okay. Some of the data that I wanted, website details, traffic details, external information provided online, frequency of online content update, products and services online. So all these things were captured. All, and these ones are all part of what I, I tried to do in collecting data from this, the field. Now, these, all the, this one is artifact examination. This one, the other one was interviews. You have seen interviews. Some of these are prof. You, you mentioned playing the things. What are you showing us? So this is interviews. And it, the interview, the objectives are well defined. This is artifact examination, examining a website, examining a physical artifact. Now look at this other one. This one is documentary analysis. The documents are wonderful. Internal documents and industry documents. What was the objective of using these ones in my study? It's also stated. So you've got organizational reports, e-commerce product documentation, strategy and plans, minutes of data and minutes. All of these are captured there. Okay. Then contextual data, the people that are the firms that I went to at both my main and pilot study. In the main study, I did 46 interviews in total, 26 main interviews, and then Twenty-six main interviews and twenty follow-up interviews. The snowballing interviews. Remember, then I had breakdown the different companies that I interviewed. They made I did a case study of Langa Consult, Casa Drain Company, that's Casa Pro, and Just Mod Fabrics and Garments, that's Lisdon Lisdon Fabrics and Garments, just at North Lagoon. Okay, then the list of twenty-eight firms. Twenty-eight firms. I also did twenty-eight interviews, which were beyond the forty-six I had done. Twenty-six. 26, 28 interviews. That one was done in the pilot study to before I went to the, the main case. So 28 to formulate my understanding of the Ghana business and ICT context. So you have to know who you are interviewing, why you are interviewing them. And in doing that one, the 28, I had this company. So busy internet, internet home, Africa online, Africa, internet Ghana, business Ghana, city solution, internet technology, mobile net. Manufacturing companies are interviewed. Financial companies are interviewed. Uh, web and IS developers that are in Canada are interviewed. Uh, ICT supermarkets. Okay. Then tertiary education. I went to business school. I went to Kofi Annan's place. I went to um, the news from Ghana today, Sikasem, Aital. I also went to Peace FM. I don't know. Peace, uh, Peace FM online. I don't, I don't have it here, but I remember I went there. And then I also went to um, Registrar General, Ministry of Communication, Ministry of National Communication Authority, National Export Promotion Council. So, yes. Okay. So what you have ended up seeing here is that I, I, all the things that you, I said is possible. You have seen you have seen data collection in terms of my interviews, who I talked to. I've seen my documentary analysis and some of my archival information looking at those from the organization internally and those also are in the trade or industry. I've also shown you my artifact examination, the method in which I was using to examine the website. And it is all referenced. So I was basing it on somebody who has also given a, a, a schema, uh, for a schema for um, uh, analyzing websites. Then from there, I have my interview construct. So I'm just showing you the possibilities. Please, is this good? Is this good? If you are, is this good? Mm -hmm. Is this good? Mm, Sandra, is this good? I just want to hear from you. Those of you who are chatting, can let me know. Was that good for you? Hello? Hey, everybody's asleep. <laughs> Steven, thank you very much. You are the only person I'm with. The ladies have left and going to sleep. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> hey, Habiba. Hey, my friend Habiba is here. She's in the house. Okay, so let's continue. So we go to um, the next thing that after you have collected the data. Okay, Philip, what are you saying? But prof, the timeline for all these as and gets our timeline period. Oh. <laughs> uh, Priscilla, thank you very much. Um, 
I'm not saying you can do all this within the given time that you have, but, but Philip, what you're saying is a very good question. We don't have much time in doing our long essay. We have a, you don't have a semester, you have two semesters. You actually start your long essay in the first semester. Some students don't do anything, they waste wait for the last semester. So the first semester of the, in fact, some, in some department, you start the vacation of the first, first semester, first year, second semester vacation. So by the time you come first semester in the second year, you have already begun. But that's when you begin, second year, first semester. So you have got a year. Right, you are here. Okay, so uh, Selena, thank you. So you have got, let's look at ensuring validity and reliability. This, these sections, we will discuss them into detail later again. Now, construct validity is about identifying co correct operational measures for the concept being studied. What do I mean by that? If you are doing the study, you ask yourself, um, are you collecting what you said you are measuring? Is it measuring what you said you are measuring? I've always mentioned that sometimes people have different interpretations of what you are saying. Angela, you get a letter from your department and your department will give you a, an introductory letter to stating that you are a student from the University of Ghana, stating what you are going to do and it will help you to, you to collect your data. So that's part of what, you, what happens. Okay. Micheline. Hi. <laughs> this name. Okay. Oh, okay. Because they look at constant validity. Identifying correct operational measures for the concepts being studied. Make sure that whatever you choose to study, the variables you are studying is what you're actually trying to measure. So for some of the students, what they do is that they go to other people's papers and look at how you measure certain variables. So that those things are captured in, their, in the questions that they're asking. So if you are measuring something like perceived enjoyment, how has perceived enjoyment been studied? If it has been studied quantitatively, you see them as items and they'll have variables for them. But if you are, you are studying qualitatively, you have to change those questions into those items into necessary questions. So let's look at an example. So I remember we were doing, when we began, we did this particular, uh, we looked at this particular issue, if you remember. Um, this paper on, let me see, theories. Okay. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to show you two of them. In fact, let me see if I can find a third one. Third one. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, good. Um, so let me show you about three different ones. The first one that I'll show you is, remember this paper, chair of plant behavior, being applied to understand brand love. If you look into the ending of the work, you have the questionnaire there. So this is the, because it's quantitative, they will show you it in terms of the items of measurement. Don't put a full questionnaire there. But they, what they would have done is that they would have put this one and say in the, in the scale of one to seven or one to five, you should run strongly agree and agree. So they will ask the brand is special, the brand is unique and a unique, uniqueness, pleasure. By buying this brand, I take pleasure. Discovering products from this brand is pure pleasure to me. So if you were doing this quantitatively, you have the variable unique and then ask yourself, do you think the brand is special? Why do you say it's special? Do you think the brand is unique? Why do you think it's unique? And then go to pleasure. When you buy this brand, does it give you pleasure? When you discover, so you then turn this one to kind of questions that will I measure the same thing. You can't just, just come up with questions without having a specific relationship with what you're trying to do. Do you understand me? So what I'm trying to emphasize here is that the qualitative, quantitative person will state it as items and put measurements of, um, uh, a degree of association or degree of agreement to it. So we say by bring, buying this brand, I take pleasure. Strongly agree, um, um, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree, then you choose one. Qualitative will rather turn this one to a question and you have the still the variable, the pleasure. So when you buy this brand, referring to whichever brand it is, does it give you pleasure? So that is what I'm trying to let you understand. 
Don't just create questions just because you think you can do a study. Try to see whether there are literature in the work, that are, there are literature in, in the, in, on, on the, on the variables you are trying to study. Look, this is about theory of plan behavior, attitude. The love I feel for brand X is to me interesting, fun, punishing or rewarding, undesirable or desirable. Now, I would ask quantity, what do you love, do you feel for brand X? Then I'll listen to the person and I can then listen to the person because the person will express a comment, a quotation, and I'll take the quotation itself into in, the, in, in a form of, when I analyze, I'll know whether what the person says is interesting or not interesting, or it's fun or not fun. So I would then put analysis. So I would like to have them make them open questions and hear from the person. Subjective norm. Do you think people who are important to you uh, think that you should have that brand? Do you think, so I'll ask you the question more in an open way then you can answer. Hmm. Okay, so now this is quantitative. So let's look at qualitative now. Okay, so now remember this paper, triggers of entrepreneurship among, I hope I'm sharing the right paper, sorry. Uh, I'm showing my whole desktop rather. <laughs> Where is this paper? Where is this paper? Okay, this is it. Uh, this is okay. So, the triggers of entrepreneurship among creative consumers. Now, look at the questionnaire that he had a very simple one interview guide. Can you introduce yourself in a natural settings? Natural settings. Can you tell me the chronology of, you, of your innovating project starting from the idea? How did you come up with your idea? What was, what was or were your origins of the idea? Was this, you know, was this innovation for you or your family or society? Remember at some time I was telling, teaching you, and I say, how do you measure ownership? Who owns it? Hmm. And you see, he's now asking two questions on ownership alone. If you remember, when I was teaching you uh, um, qualitative research last week, I told you that qualitative research has um, subjectivity. And if you are asking questions on things like gender and ownership, you should know so that like I, I put an example that you own the enterprise. And I told that ownership has many meanings. You mean the person who takes decisions or the person who founded it or the person who has, um, who inherited it. Now look at the questions like, what were the origins of the idea? How do you come up with your idea? These are all related to ownership. The last one, um, was this innovation for you, family or society? So now he's actually trying to point out the personality or the person who is it. Who has it? How, how, has, how was the prototyping or design step? Do you receive help from your family members? Have you found a patent? Can you tell me in detail when you decide to start your own firm? Can you identify what drove you that choice? Can you indicate the weight of each motivation to become an entrepreneur? What do you feel by when thinking about people who use your motivation? This is subjective now. What do you feel when thinking about people who use your um, innovation? What did this new activity take place in your life? What place did this new activity take place in, take, take in your life, in your daily life? How do you consider yourself as an entrepreneur? So these are about 14 questions being requested or being asked in an interview guide. Now, because it's qualitative, he has very an open manner, and open questions are being given. But it doesn't mean that all qualitative are open questions. Okay. Now let's look at another one here. Now this paper has to do with introduction of small of, of accounting practices in small business in small family businesses. I remember I told you about this one. Now look at the first part. Section one: organizational background, settings, natural settings. What is the main business? Remember what I told you: firm profile, organizational background. What is the history of the business? I told you the same thing. Who started it? How long did it start? This is the same thing as the, the background to the phenomenon. Okay, what, what services? So the first one is about, the first one is about a firm profile. The second one is then also given into the background to the phenomenon. What type of market is the company in? What's your perception in terms of profitability of the company? Do, do you plan to retire anytime? How do you succeed? Do you have an, a plan for succession? Now, you see what I just showed you. Okay, so now let's go back to this. 
Look at what I told you just a few minutes ago. Look at this firm profile. Uh, let me this one or not. Good. Who, what, how, structure, resources, achievements, financial performance. That is what the person is doing. This very same thing I just told you is what the person is doing here. Sorry. Oh, good. This very same thing is what the person is doing in here. So then he goes accounting system. He's trying to stay in accounting system. He's going to the phenomenon itself. Then after that, doing that, there's a changes in the accounting practices. Okay. Then decision making process. Okay. So that's where it ends. So you see, you structure your questionnaire based on what you are trying to study and the variables that pertains to it. I just wanted you to get that understanding as we go on. Then internal validity to seek seeking to establish causal relationship, thereby certain conditions are believed to lead to other conditions. Good. So in most of the time, what a person will do is that when he's writing the case, he will tell you certain information, the natural settings that can help you understand what you see next. For example, a person will now tell you for internal validity, he'll tell you that the person has junior high school education. So when he tells you the person can send test message, you can believe it. So construct the validity is about how you measure. Internal validity is about establishing that there's a causal relationship. So I think they just show up in the study. They have external validity. They define the domain to which study findings can be generalized. So I said, look at page 57 of paper one, lesson three. So let's look at paper one. Let me go to paper one. Hmm. So this is paper one. Okay. So let's see paper one. Page 57, 50 now. This is page 57. Okay. Now look at it. Okay. So he's trying to. Um, so we should be 57. We should look at how the person developed lesson three. So this is okay. So, however, the, let me read from here. However, the extent of usage of mobile phones is mediated by affordability and accessibility of mobile services. Concerning accessibility, the key challenges to the usage of mobile phones were observed to be network failure, drop costs, and high cost of airtime. These challenges encourage the traders to have more than one mobile subscription in order to stay connected to trading partners and customers. Poor network coverage and network failures in rural areas where, far, where, where farms are located often affect communication with uh, trading partners. Wholesalers like Grace find it difficult to communicate with customers in Accra when they travel to buy some, to travel to some villages to buy maize from farmers. Hence, Grace Hence, Grace subscribes to two mobile network operators and uses operator, the operator with a better network covering coverage depending on her location. Before we could make that argument, we established a premise about the poor network coverage. So we can then say hence. So this is all about accessibility to the mobile phone. So the accessibility, because of the poor accessibility around, people end up having double phones. Okay, now concerning affordability, the high cost of mobile phones and initial connection charges is another barrier. Traders, as with Grace and AA, usually purchase using mobile phones. They consider top up airtime vouchers to be inexpensive since no denominations are available. Promotional services, which offer reduced call tariffs, like family and friends, favorites, are primarily used by small businesses and micro enterprises to communicate with key customers. Therefore, even though Retailers earn low income. They still find it beneficial to own a, a to own to own mobile phones by keeping the cost of owning and operating mobile phone low. In case A, A had to purchase two for mobile phones, one for Jane, her employee, and the other for herself, and subscribe to the same mobile network. Thus, the use of the mobile phone technology in trading is, is determined by the readiness of the actors in the transaction to own or access and use the mobile phone. This readiness is partly 
partly define the benefits obtained. These findings are suggestive of now looking. In micro trading activities, benefits obtained by the trader it tends to be partly influenced by the extent of mobile phone used by trader and other and other actors, customers and trading partners in the value chain. Now he said in micro trading activities, he didn't say in live trading activities. He is studying only micro trading, so he, he ended up concluding on micro trading activities. He also started looking into what are the issues here. The issues here is that it seems that both both Grace and AA are putting in all measures to make sure that they are mobile, they have got, they are connected to the mobile phone, and they are also their trading partners are using the mobile phone. So they use family and friends promotional services. They also try to make sure they have double phones or their phones in which they are on the same network, so that they can enjoy um, some reduced cost uh, in call call cost. Now it shows that the benefits obtained by the trader is directly influenced by or partly influenced by the extent to which the mobile phone is used by her herself and then other trading partners and customers. And that's what she has trying to illustrate. She has tried to illustrate there. Now, in, if you go back to what we were trying to look at, our, our argument here was that in external validity, define the domain to which the finding, findings can be generalized. We don't go and say that in all training activities, say in micro training activities, depending on the study, we are very careful where we extend the truth. Because in qualitative research, especially in case study research, we are not doing statistical generalization. We are doing theoretical generalization. This one works here because of the presence of this. So it could work there because the other one has a similar presence of the same thing. And that is what you are seeing here. Then you have got reliability. Reliability happens in demonstrating that the operations of the study, such as data collection, particular repeated the same results. Now it means that we are providing enough information so that when somebody picks our study, he can also go and replicate it and then get almost the same results. That's what it's just trying to, that makes the study reliable. In order to achieve constant validity, we have to use multiple sources of evidence, establish a chain of evidence, and review the case report, study report. I will also say that multiple sources of evidence is not just about where you collect data from. It's also about where you draw the insights about the measurement for your constructs. Where are you getting it from? You have read about a construct, you are trying to use it. Have you read other papers to see how they have measured this in those papers? Okay, then you establish a chain of evidence that you have collected data that can actually speak to that particular matter and the people were responding with that particular understanding. Then internal validity has to do with pattern matching, where we're looking for patterns to be able to justify what we have found. Or explanation building, addressing rival explanation and using logic models. Now, in, in internal validity, our objective here is to point out that if this and this are the prerequisites and they exist, it means that these other things could okay. That's what we are trying to do. So we have to we do a lot of if then test in, in uh, internal validity. So you try to compare what can I see, what patterns can I see? If this one is existing, can I see that this one could also exist? That's the kind of stuff that we that's the kind of way that you examine it in terms of internal validity. External validity, when you are doing a single case, it's more about theory. What do you compare the work to? So if you are doing your conclusion in relation to the theory, I can say this and that. Now, if you are doing multiple cases, then you can then look at beyond the theory, you can say in, in, in relation to micro trading, in relation to the, this particular above cases, I can say that this relates to this. So you have to know where you actually say that, make your conclusions, place your conclusions on. Internal, external validity looks into that issue very much. Then reliability, to be able to enhance reliability, when you're starting the study, you have a, clear, a clearly spelled out case study protocol. And when you finish, you develop your case study database so that others can look at it and use it to replicate your study. Okay, wow, we still have more to do when we are here. Okay, don't worry, let's see. So we are writing the case study down. How do you write the case study? These are the difficult parts. How do you write a case study? The first thing about writing the case study is about looking at what you are intending to write. What are you intending to write? So you are going to start by writing the case background, the case context, where the context for the case is. And usually it may be the firm profile. Then you go to the background to the phenomenon and the case phenomenon itself. Now, the case study reflects the results from the study 
which is which will be analyzed to determine answers to the research project objectives. These the results are a collection of arguments which are being put together to tell a logical story about a bounded system. Arguments are a set of ideas which are expressed or and how they are constituted in writing of other forms is fundamental. Making convincing arguments involves working out how to construct, communicate, and support and substantiate it. So to be able to do know how to write, we need to understand the type of arguments we can put across within our write-up. The first type of argument we can put across is called a mechanical argument. That tries to tell you how something works or something or place or something is constituted. <clears throat> so those of you who don't know what a mechanical argument is, if you look at the beginning paragraph of the work, of the cases I, looked, I, I mentioned, case A and case B, all of them try to talk about how the person runs the business. And Tia Kusia here, after I refer to as Tumatu Wittila, she has junior high school education and has been working on, so that is all these things is about. It's about mechanical arguments. So if you look at the example again that we had on, um, let me just use this one. Um, okay, I thought I had, let me just, the study that we're looking at earlier, good. Now, if we look into this one, this, the accounting practices. Look at what you're saying there. What is the main business of the service and the organization? What is the history of the business? Who started it? So in the first part, what's the main business? We are trying to ask about a mechanical argument. But the next one, which is about how the person began his business, is more about developmental argument. So you should look at the differences very carefully. So the mechanical argument seeks to be able to explain how something works. So Antia Kusia does this, she sells this, she brings the thing to the other person and then it gets to her car. That's the kind of thing you're telling us. <laughs> but when you finish that one, then the next part that you have to do is a developmental argument. A developmental argument tells us or try to explain a social process of phenomena through a detailed contextual multi-layered interpretation. So that's what you do. And the objective here is to tell us, to tell us how something occurred. So if you look at the example that we had earlier, say prior to owning the mobile phone, communication between A and J was constrained by distance. The limited access to Jane often contributed to poor inventory management and where A could be out of stock for tomatoes for a week. In such scenarios, so all this is telling you the background information. How do we arrive at, um, how the person arrived at using a mobile phone. So there's giving you just the background information. Good. If you look at our example here, the author is doing a similar thing. What is the history of the business? Who started the business? What are the services offered? What were the first services offered and products offered? How did they evolve over time? Now look at this. Put your pen, your eye on that section, and let me just show you something here. Okay, so I just want to show you that, show you something here. Um, let me see if I can have it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, if you look at this particular one, the study that we are looking at, e-commerce capabilities, if you look at it very carefully, it actually captures the same thing. The first part is about business resource development, the business that the hide began, the challenges they faced, and then finding a new supply, car supply online. And then, um, okay, so you have finding a car, a car supplier online. And then after that, you say first pitches and first customer. That's the same thing that you see the person doing here. Same thing you see the person doing here. So it's similar. Same thing what the person is doing here. Same thing. Okay, then you go to what are the perception. So I just want you to see the relationship between what we are talking about. So this one is more of a developmental argument. How to, 
how the thing happened, how it occurred. Then you also have other arguments that may be called comparative arguments. Somebody comparing A to B, you need to make a choice. The aim is to draw an explanatory significance from a specified site of comparisons, and therefore the logical explanation is tied up to the mechanism of comparison. For example, in case B, the mobile phone made it easy for Grace to carry out her transactions more effectively, more efficiently. She does not have to travel to do her business unless she has to go around for unless she has to go around to collect the, data, the payments. This she does once in a month. Grace explains that I don't need to come to a crowd to supply me. All I do is take orders on, on the phone and I hire the truck to send the commodities. I don't have to put my life at risk by making unnecessary journeys. So at the first level, you're just doing a comparison between either coming in person or using a mobile phone to reduce the amount of times you come in person. And that's what he's putting it across there. Then you have got arguments about causation and prediction. Causal arguments that are usually framed, causal arguments are usually framed in terms of effects of variables on each other. However, that is not, however, that, sorry, however, that is not the focus of quantitative research. Causality focuses on, focuses on detail, complexity, and contextuality, contextuality, and not expecting to find a cause and effect in a straightforward fraction. Prediction is, however, concerned with how and why a phenomena or process can imp happen in particular circumstances and in particular ways can certainly support a predictive ideas about how those things might vary in, in context. Okay, so that example is put here. Now, in terms of this is about causation of prediction. So it says that a number of interrelated issues relating to financial constraints at the firm national level and national level, the limitations of relying on social networks, the importance of trust, and limited managerial knowledge of e-commerce procedures. Contributed, contributed to the failure of the of the project. John resolved that if he had to develop a new new website, if John resolved that if he had to develop a new website, then it had to be done in a manner in which he could have adequate control, knowledge, and flexibility to manage its content and web hosting service. Now, what is happening here? These three things that you see being mentioned here at the beginning, interrelated issues actually led John to lose his website. He, he gave money to somebody to buy, um, to renew the website for him, the, the, the account for him in the UK. The person spent the money, didn't do it. So he, so that's why I say limitations of social networks, importance of trust, limited managerial knowledge. He didn't know how to um, uh, manage his domain name for his website. At that time, very few firms were also running such services in Ghana. So if anything, you have to have a credit card to be able to renew your account. So his friend had a credit card, he gave the money to the person, the person spent the money, didn't do the renewal of the account. So he lost everything that he had developed online. And he had to start it, so he had to start it from scratch. So John then resolved that he had to develop a website, then it had to come then in a manner that he could have adequate control and not leave it in the hands of other people. So what you see here is much more, more about something happened and then that led to a particular behavior. So sometimes you, you can write in a way that you want to show that this is what led to this particular outcome. This is what led to this particular outcome. Okay. So you have mechanical argumentation, you have got developmental argumentation, comparative argumentation, and cause and causative and predicted, which you can then uh, apply to your work. Okay. Don't worry about the assignment, it's not targeted at you. Mm -hmm. So this gives you a nutshell of how these data how we write the case study. What then becomes of us is that how then do we collect the data to be able to write the case study? Please, if you have any question, put it in the platform and I'll answer. <clears throat> how then do you collect the data to be able to um, examine the cases, uh, examine the, do you collect data and then use it to analyze, analyze the data for your, to find answers to your research questions. So let's look at, techniques for acquiring data. This is quite a very brief session. The first one has to do with observation, interviews, documents, and text, and audiovisual material. Now, the first thing, I, what I'm trying to say is that anytime anybody is starting a study, you need to establish their context and publication, population. 
For us in Ghana, most of us are doing the study on Ghana, so it's defined. But within Ghana, where are you doing the study? What is the population? Which phenomenon are you looking into? What's the scope of the issue? Are you looking at all the banks in Ghana, rural banks? Um, are you looking at uh, customers of rural banks, customers of public banks, commercial banks? What is your focus? You need to be clear about that. Then you have to establish your data collection method. Before you even do that, you have to choose your methodology and your methods. Then you choose your data collection method and then you choose your sample or you choose your sample first and choose your data collection method. Okay. The field work is the context. In, when you're establishing context, you are trying to say the field work. How do you get access to where you collect data from? The data site is what we call the field work. The particular context in which the data collection occurs. Now, data collection will be taking place at the same time as analysis. So you'll be analyzing as you are looking at the data, as, and I'll explain that later. So you need to justify why the case is being selected, access, how you get access to the police, what to be done on the activity at that, at that place, whether you interfere or disrupt existing, uh, or you will participate in the study, or you interfere in, and then participate in whatever they do in the institution that you are trying to do a study in. Or you would also um, disrupt what they are doing. Or lastly, uh, and lastly, the duration and frequency in which you, you, you would be visiting there to collect data. The first one has to do with interviews. Interviews is a structured, um, uh, it's a means of collecting the information from the subject's own words. It can be structured or unstructured. So there are two, there can be two extremes. In a structured, you have open, flexible interview, no structured format like what I showed you earlier. And it's very flexible. Then partially structured, the topic is chosen, the questions are formulated, but the order is up to the interviewer. The unstructured, the topic is chosen, but there are no questions. Partially structured, the questions are to the topic is chosen, the questions are chosen, but the, how you present is up to the reviewer or up to the, um, the interviewer. Then the semi structured, the questions are determined, the order of presentation is determined. So you're going to follow an order of presentation, like I showed you earlier one, two, three, four. You go through the different steps and ask the person the, the questions. But what will be advisable is that sometimes you may realize that other questions can come up and you have to allow the person to ask them. Then the challenge that you can also have with semi-structured is that sometimes, um, as you are listening, you want to record the essence of each response. So you have to be quite fast to be able to hear the person and then record that part. I be quite fast to hear the person record that part. That's why sometimes you have a multiple and when you are doing your interview, you could actually give the interview guide or sheet to the person you're interviewing. If you had in prior time to before meeting, you can even he can do preliminary answers and then come and discuss with you too when you're interviewing the person. Then you have totally structured and unstructured and unstructured. Those ones, the questions are determined, the order is determined but the responses are coded by the interviewer. So as the person asks you that for the structured, where do you live? He says, I live at Santasi or Kumasi. Then you just write, oh, okay, Ashanti region. Instead of writing the Kumasi or Santasi, you are more concerned about the regions. Okay. Totally structured, the questions and order are determined, coding is predetermined, and they are giving the respondent specific um, alternatives to choose between. So you're going to choose either between A or B, A or B, or A, B, C, D, E. That has to do with the Likert scale. If you are doing five point Likert scale, I agree, so I agree. That's what you end up doing. Okay, so that'll be totally structured. So qualitative researchers like to draw on interviews, which are very open or semi-structured. Whilst quantitative researchers like to draw on a random random samples using face choice questionnaires. So you have to see the differences between the two. Now interviews. Interviews come up when you are doing them, you should know that you have to be patient and listen to the person more and talk less. Follow up with what the participants will say. Don't be judgmental. You're not there to push your political agenda. You're there to learn from others. Keep it focused and avoid leading questions. Allow the person to answer through open-ended questions. Don't answer the questions for the person. And you're not debating the person, you're just recording. 
Now, there are sometimes you do group interviews, which we call them focus group discussion. Multiple participants are involved. Now, this is very good if you want to uncover certain type of behaviors in the group. A semi-structured group se session moderated by a group leader held in an informal setting with the purpose of collecting data or information on a specific topic. Carefully planned discussion designed to obtain perceptions on the defined area of interest in a permissive, non-threatening environment. Okay. So in focus groups, you want to be sure that there are, you need them, you know why you're doing them. Most of the people do that for exploratory studies. And then they all, when they are doing that, the objective is to try to understand the gap that exists between two groups. So maybe rural men as against to urban men. Okay, and then also to uncover factors relating to complex behavior. So people would like to share in the group instead of sharing on their own. You may have more confidence in sharing the group. And then you have the desire for immediate ideas to emerge from a group and then additional information to prepare for a larger study. Most of the time, people do do it in, the, in anticipation that they'll be doing a bigger study. So they do a focus group to get insights into what the variables look like and what people's responses are to the things of the mean to try to measure. Then when you're doing case studies, you should note that it is not good for an emotionally charged subject or environment. And when you do some projections, you don't use a case study, because case study, or you don't use a, a focus group, because focus groups will not give you a statistical num uh, um, numerations or uh, projections as you may require. And anytime you are doing focus group, confidentiality is an issue, because people may be in a group, no, you're not knowing each other, but they'll be sharing certain things and may be sensitive. In carrying out a focus group discussion, you want to, a general rule is to plan for less time than you can tell the participants. You want to do about six to three participants in a group. And then you want to keep it small so that you can manage the group, you can manage the group, especially for transcription. And then you also want to make sure that the people who are coming in the group are, are homogeneous. They, are, they share similar experiences. Don't want people who have got different experiences to come into the group. Okay, so that is the focus group discussion. You start by having a round robin question, asking everybody, and then you go to the background and locate, locate um, the people in relation to, to, to other people. So, and this person did this and this and well done here. What about you? So you try to bring others in by referring to others and referring to each other. So in that scenario, your objective is to try to create an easy environment, an easy an, an environment of ease, so that people can have confidence to share. Okay. Then you have um, the trans the transition. You move on to the key questions you want to ask, and I, as I told you, be very careful of asking questions when you are looking for direct experiences, and rather you are getting indirect or knowledge experiences. Try to know when somebody is talking to you out of knowledge or somebody is talking to you out of an actual direct experience, please. It's very, very important. Otherwise, you have a lot of reportage on indirect, um, indirect knowledge about the indirect experience, and then you're just giving their knowledge about the issue. Then there's also opinions. After they are giving their experiences, you can also ask opinions. Opinions could be what the, the people could stand or their ideology about the issue or kind of value they may have concerned the issue as they are studying. So opinions could also be requested and the feelings people have could also be requested. And when you finish, you bring the study to a close. Remember that because you are dealing with people in the group, you should always have a consent form for them to fill and complete before they start the, the study. Because most of the time, when you fill your focus group, one of the first questions that you ask, you may be asked is that, did you have a consent form that encouraged you to even interact with these people? Do you have a consent form that encouraged you? A consent form that brought your, into your mind, that allowed people to even know that the data they are sharing with you will be appropriately used. Okay, so please keep that in mind, remain in the consent form. Yes, you can't use case study, um, um, so focus group for Sanskrit, uh, projections. For, 
For example, if I'm doing interviews for a survey where I can say I interview 100 people, 30 or 20 percent said yes, 20 percent said no. How are you going to do the same thing with focus group? In focus group, your objective is not collecting individual views, it's about a collective group. So you have got about six groups, and maybe three of them are just female-based groups, and three of them are male-based groups. You cannot go and say that 80% of the women said this, or 30% of the women said this. That's not what you are doing. You are trying to establish meanings. So you can say that the women tend to agree on this issue. So because you have seen an agreement in group A, group B, group C, which is for the women. And then group D and group E and group F, which is for the men. You realize that there's a disagreement on the perception of this issue, not the quantity. So your objective is not to state quantity, but to state uh, and look at theoretical generalization. What happens here and why does it happen in relation to the theory? To you, are you okay? So the next part, can you get expert, expert on that subject for that purpose? Uh, no, it depends on what you are trying to study. There are certain things that is good that people, people do, do a study to, to get an idea of it. Now, let me point something to you. Um, I did a study on students' perceptions concerning um, students' perception concerning uh, video-based learning, because I do a lot of video-based learning. So I we, did, we did interviews with 20 of them, and we put them into some groups, and then we interviewed them. So what we are analyzing, we actually analyze based on what the people are saying in the group that they are. We occasionally point out that one person said this or one person said that. But we are capturing the essence, what is the general agreement here, not the numbers. So in that scenario, you need an expert. So you have to know your study. Please, in all these things are tied to your research purpose and your research, your research study, your research title. You can't just say that, oh, this one, you just do an expert analysis. If your views is to get something about the economy and an expert will give you, fair enough, I don't have a problem. But if your view, your studies are about students and you want to interact with students, then you will do it the way you can interact with students. So please note the differences. <coughs> <coughs> then you have observation. Observation means that you are actually going to a context, a, a context to, your, to, to the objective of trying to observe um, the, 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 the occurrence of a phenomenon. So we have a participant observer. When the observer then comes into the contest and then he makes himself known to the participants and then he participates and sits in it and he involves himself and immerses himself in the study, in, in the, on the phenomenon. So that one is called participant observer. Then there is also the non-participant observer, which the person has made himself known by he's sitting somewhere watching what the students are doing. That's a non-participant observer on the unobtrusive observer, he's not going to intrude and, and then try to interfere with what they have. They will just observe them. Then you have the naturalistic observation ob observer, the one that the observer is coming to the natural settings to observe the person. Now, it may not necessarily tell you that he's there, he's there, but he's come to watch you. He's not going to manipulate anything. He'll just come to watch and then out of it, he makes his decision. Now, in such a scenario, you see that especially with um, in sports, when a, a coach goes to a football match to go and scout for somebody, he may not tell the person is there, he watches him play and then make an offer to the person after the game is over. So that could be a naturalistic observation, observing the person, the natural settings in which the phenomenon occurs, in which the phenomenon occurs. Then covert observation comes that when you have to hide yourself and collect data. People do that, sometimes they hide to collect data. They don't tell them, they don't do, the, the objective here is to not to interfere with the issue, but to be able to present a particular perception, perspective, so that people, the people that are studying can actually be confident and share as they want to share. So covert uh, observation can happen. Especially in marketing, people use covert observation method called, um, um, a variant of it called mystery shopper, in which they will send somebody to go and buy something from a shop, but he will observe all the mannerisms of customer, uh, customer service reps uh, of the sh uh, uh, shop attendant, and then uh, the, uh, the level of um, understanding he gained whilst he was there trying to, or selling the quality of service he gained whilst you're trying to buy and uh, buy something. So the marketers use it a lot, and they use it to assess firms and they mention actually rank firms. And sometimes firms pay people to go and do mystery shopping for them. Go to this branch and do a mystery shopping for for me. 
Then you have simulations. Simulations occur when um, respondents are asked to try to act out their views concerning a particular uh, uh, um, um, data source. For example, you are studying lectures and you want to know a view of the students concerning the lecture, you can tell the students to, uh, you can inform the students to try to act out the certain situation. That will depict the lecture so they can have a better picture of how the lecturer behaves. So that could be one way. But we don't do that much in the University of Ghana. We focus much more on the either the naturalistic observation or the participant observation. Now, in, in the research process, we also have, on the other hand, a quantitative approach like survey. Survey um, research as a study is a study on large, small populations by selecting samples chosen from a desired population to, to discover re relative incidence, distribution, and interrelations. So we learn about the larger population by studying the sample, by studying the sample through a survey. Okay. So you have got mail-based service where it's quite cheap. You post it to people by very slow and lowest of response rates. Some people will not return it. Web-based service is good, but sometimes you have to be very careful because you need to have specific people who you want to respond. So you, need, you may need their email addresses. And then you, one good thing about it is that, sorry, one good thing about um, web service is the fact that it's not just also cheap. It may be very fast. It may be very fast. For you, and it means some of the web platforms can even analyze the data for you in a preliminary sense. But you should also be careful of biases. If you don't put the necessary security um, elements in it, you may have people answering from who have not experienced the issue from all across the world. You want to be very specific about the IP, and the person has to be in Ghana to answer. And the person may have gone through this, have had maybe this level of education before you can answer. And then you can also have telephone interviews, which are relatively you can also have telephone interviews which are relatively also okay for an environment in which you don't um, you just have to call the people and interview them it's moderate cost because you have to put some money into it it's fast but sometimes inconvenient for the Respondent, because the respondents cannot stay on, on the phone for complex questions. If this is this and this, then what do you say about that? He may not even remember, or you are reciting possible answers to a person. Do you do this because of this A, B, C, D? By the time you get to the E, he's forgotten about A or B. So be careful of being spending more time on telephone interview. It's very good for you follow up interview just for clarification. But if you are going to do the full interview and interview then on phone, then you should reduce the amount of questions you are asking. Then you can also have email-based interview, which is not mentioned here. You put your emails, you put your questions in email and send them, but you need to have the email address of the person. Now, what is good about that is sometimes people even write more and even answer in more detail. But sometimes so others are also afraid of who you are going to share the data with, so they may not choose to answer in honesty. Then you have got the face-to-face, -face, which is very expensive to do. It has a low, a low highest, uh, uh, it's slow and has a highest response rate because you can sit down with the person and tell the person to answer. And this, these are different approaches in handling survey. So different approaches in handling survey. I'm hoping that I can give you new and some nuggets about how to manage either collection the COVID-19 period. And let me continue and let me finish my presentation. So sampling. Sampling is the process of selecting samples from a group of population to become the foundation for estimating and predicting the outcome of a population. So we study the sample to be able to talk about the population. And the, the sample therefore is a subset of the population. The population is the group of entities that you want to actually study. Now, when you create a, num a, 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 a number, you number the population or try to have a, a document or a database that has all the possible elements in the population, we say you have created what we call a sample, a sampling frame. A frame in which there's a list of all the potential members or possible members of the, uh, or elements of the population so that you can treat the sample form. But you have to understand that it's not all of them that will be accessible. So usually what's accessible to you then becomes the working population, the working population. There are two categories of sampling. I got probability sampling and then non-probability sampling. 
with a probability sampling, there's a known non-zero probability for every element. I know probability of selecting every element. But with a non probability sampling, there is not a known probability for selecting any, any element. It means that there's no uh, probability, you don't have, the probability for selecting every member is unknown. But with the one that is probability sampling, the probability of selecting every member is known. So for example, if you have a die, there are six sides of a die. If I throw the die, I have one out of six chances of getting any of the faces showing up. And that is a known probability. But if I want to do interviews on the street and I just go and stay on the street, I can't have a known probability of how many people I'm going to, who and who I'm going to select. All I have to do is to use convenience sampling where I'm asking people questions and they just, if they say they are agreed and they join the study. So in qualitative research, you are not seeking for representation or generalization statistically. So we, our objective here is to get people who can understand the phenomenon and can really share their views concerning their phenomenon. But with quantitative, because you want a representative sample that whatever you choose is representation of the actual university population, you have to be very careful how you arrive at that. In terms of, um, um, in terms of sampling approach, you want to make sure that the sample that you end up choosing is a reflection of the actual population of the, of the institution. And that is what you see in quantitative sampling. Objective here is to generalize based on a particular um, sample onto the population. It means that if I'm generalizing based on a research on a sample, then I have to make sure that my sample has almost all the key characteristics of the uh, population. However, in qualitative research is what we are focused on. We do non probability sampling in which we cannot know determine the sample size prior to the work. So, or, or, or in advance, we actually go in and then learn as we go on. Okay, so there are different types. There's haphazard sampling, snowballing, repulsive, and then deviant. There's quite a number of other ones, if you look in my book. Okay, the convenient sampling come, or haphazard sampling comes in when the sampling procedure of obtaining the people or units have been most, uh, most conveniently available. That means that somebody comes out of his office and start looking at the people who are standing out there, start interviewing them. And that is what he says he's doing. In that scenario, his um, sampling approach can become highly biased or highly in ineffective because you may only get a certain type of people because of the, where you are standing. For example, if you just come out of your office and you want to sample to get the number of people, or to create a sample of people for a, a, a study on the economy of Ghana, and there is a demonstration taking place. By the time you realize the people that you choose, they, because of the response of the event, they will end up all coming to say that Ghana is not good because of the kind of people that you selected outside your office. So they are conveniently accessible to you, but they may not, may not give you a representative sample. Convenient and haphazard sample may not always give you a representative sample. It may just give you access to the people, but it may not give you uh, a representative sample about, about them. Okay. Then you can also have purposive sampling. An experience in purposive sampling, you, have, you choose based on the, fit, the purpose of the study, to fit the purpose of the study. So one of the things that you can see here is you are going to collect data and you want specific people that you want to collect data on. So you choose them, you choose the purpose, you choose the study members based on the purpose of the study. So that will guide you. I just say that it is good to establish some appropriate characteristics of the sample you are looking for so that it can, it can give you the deeper understanding you seek to obtain in your study. So you ask yourself, which are the people who are likely to have experienced this issue and can give you a deeper understanding of what you're trying to study? So those ones, when you choose, establish your characteristics, you use your characteristics to guide you to make sure that anybody that is selected in the sample has that particular experience or, or has that particular knowledge that can, be, that can be contributory to your study. So please keep that in mind. Judgment or purposive sampling means that you are choosing them to fit the purpose of the study. By the time you finish choosing them, they should be able to give you insights that can best answer your research questions. 
Now, when you say, what, some, what sample size can give you a better outcome? Well, qualitative, we don't usually do that. It's the quantitative that calculates sample size. And you can read about calculation of sample size in quantitative because you have to establish statistical significance. Qualitative is much more about the fact that you have reached a degree of data saturation, where almost all the information that you are collecting is actually the next information you collect as is a repetition of the one that you had earlier. And you realize that you have reached a place that you have exhausted almost all the possible respondents and almost all the possible data. So you have to be very careful when you are trying to do qualitative studies because you need, it's not about the numbers. It's more about do you have information to be able to describe the phenomenon. The phenomenon. Is it broad, the, the, is, is in the information generated from a broad set of, a broader set of respondents who are giving diverse perspectives of the issue? Is it rich in in-depth explanation? Is it, does it, is it void of biases which could have come from the people who responded and have you got critical perspectives of the issue? So you ask a number of questions to be able to make sure that there, you have got rich explanation of what is occurring. You have been able to get information that is not biased towards the particular view, but you are getting understanding from different perspectives and different respondents. So qualitative doesn't do that. However, in a general sense, when I was doing my PhD, my supervisor told him that the organization I'm entering has about 60 employees. Should I interview everybody? My supervisor was telling me I tried to aim at getting to about 25 for each of the organizations so that you have covered the customers, you have covered the employees, and some of the employees who are critical, you have covered senior management, you have covered some external references that can give you better information about the same company. So I, if you realize that what I showed you earlier, maybe you didn't take a notice of it. Most of the companies, the case study firms that I did, like on Lanka Consult on the other ones, I interviewed up to 18 people, up to 18 people per organization. So I'm not saying that the number is specific, it defined, do 25, do this, but do you have enough? So like I just doing three people, and those are only three people who have explained the issue and can give you information, it may be good. But sometimes you may not, it may not be best. You may have to interview, there are more people who have explained the issue, and the three people could be the core people who give you the information, but you could also step out and ask the other perspectives that others may have. And that may be more than go beyond the three people. So, an experience and um, a purpose sampling, you choose to fit the purpose of the study. Then, snowball sampling. Snowball sampling has to do with the fact that you are doing a network or chain referral or reputational sampling approach. It means that you are going to refer people to the next person, to the next person. So the first person is selected either by a random or by a purposive sampling. So, and then after collecting the, uh, talking to the first person who is relevant and has knowledge about the area, he, can, he or she can recommend the next person to you. So that's where snowball sampling comes from. The fact that the people, it's a chain-based system. They will refer you to the next person and they refer you to the next person. So they can create a very large pool of initial respondents. Okay. The last one has to do with deviant sampling. Deviant sampling has to do with the fact that you have got um, people who are deviants from the norm. They differ from the dominant pattern. So for example, school dropouts who do not have, people who drop out of school are usually set, out, set, are usually, um, set, to, have, set to have a record of illegal activities. They are coming from an unstable home and lower low income family. However, you, get, you go to an environment and you see somebody who is dropping out of school, even though he, he has no record of illegal activity, he's coming from a stable home and he's coming from an upper middle income family. So why is he dropping out? So in that case, that person becomes the deviant from the sample. Some studies require you to study the deviant from the sample. The deviant from the, from the pattern, the deviant from the pattern. It means that you create your sample based on people who deviate from the norm. And sometimes it can happen that you realize that this particular issue didn't affect these other people. Why didn't it affect them? So you want to study the deviant from the norm, the deviant from the norm, the deviant from the norm. Okay, so that's a deviant sampling. The other sampling approaches in the book, so I advise you to go and read. Most of them are about the quantitative sampling. So read about stratified sampling, cluster sampling, systematic sampling, and then random sampling. Okay. 
lastly, let's look at questionnaire design. Very simple. We did this one earlier, but I just want to go through some of the key aspects of a questionnaire. Anytime that you are developing a questionnaire, you keep in mind these three things. First of all, what have you done? What reading have you done? What background work have you done to develop a questionnaire? Have you developed your, quest, uh, your research methodology, your research, uh, uh, your research method, uh, your methodology you're going to use, whether quantitative, qualitative, or mixed methods? Have you decided on research theory or the research, um, if you don't have a theory, and you just develop a conceptual model from literature, have you finished it? Do you have some hypothesis or concepts or um, characteristics you want to study? Okay, or constructs you want to study? That has to be clear. Now, the next thing is that the wording of the question, how are you going to word your questions? Do people understand the terminologies of your question? Then lastly, the fiscal design of the of layout. You don't want to scare people to think that your question is very, very lengthy. Okay. Every good, quest, every good study will start from a, a pilot study where you give the opportunity to the students, researcher to go and test the findings that the research questions that he has or she has. In order to ascertain whether there are people have a better understanding of it, there's a possibility of even um, picking some data and using it to do a preliminary analysis and write a paper on it to see whether there's relevance in what you are doing. So you may want to, and even checking the time, the timing to for finishing the answer of the question. Timing, how long does it take to complete um, the que a questionnaire? Now, there are different types of questions. There are questions that can be created to be able to check awareness. Questions that are created to check feelings that people may have. Do you think the school should be built? Questions that are, are, that are, are also created to uh, get answers on specific parts of an issue. Questions that are also designed to uh, get responses are uh, um, responsive from respondents and then questions that can assess to what extent do the res respondents hold those views strongly. Now when you are coding for quantitative especially, you have to know that your questions that you are asking, you can code them in a manner that can be applicable to what you are doing or can have some wisdom into what you are doing. So a question like how many children do you have? Then you number up to seven. It's a lot, it's quite, it's quite a very large number. It's, it will be better for you to even put it in groups so that you can be able to situate a fair idea of what is happening. Then, because sometimes people have not even thought about having seven children, you have put the whole thing into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You could put them into different uh, categories or uh, intervals. Then you have codes that are developed from answers. Where do you leave? And the person mentioned that you write the answer based on what you, have, you want, okay. Then lastly, the idea is that you should try to make sure that you have open questions for your qualitative research instead of trying to go more towards a quantitative structured approach. Some questions have got biases in them and, are, and that biases affect the way people understand the question. For example, uh, if you, um, do you use self-service garages, self -service garages because they are easy to use or and clean? Now, easy to use and clean, something can be clean and not easy to use and something can be easy to use and not clean. So there can be an ambiguity in this particular um, question. These are all type of questions. Questions that contain familiar or difficult, difficult or unfamiliar words. Where do you usually shop? What do you mean by usually? Very, very broad term. What do you mean by usually? It's be good for you to give us a frequency of measurement. And then you can also have questions that are start with the start with words meant to communicate softness, but end up being more uh, intrusive or being direct. For example, I hope you do not mind asking this, but are you a virgin? This is a question that makes it very difficult for somebody to answer. You shall put a preamble that some of the questions may be sensitive. So if you know you can't answer, you don't want to answer them, let us know so that I can skip them. So you should know how you are, you're, there, you're not there to fight the fight with the respondent. You're supposed to build a rapport and an environment for the respondent to have confidence in sharing with you. If you create that kind of um, environment in which there's hostility and there's ho it's hostile, what happens is that the respondent will shut down and not say anything to you. It's like not taking um, the viewpoints of a lady that you are going out with uh, seriously. Other than that, she will shut down and be quiet and just be watching you. So you need to be able to prevent that thing from happening 
of creating a still meet or a still a hostile environment between you and the person you are asking questions from. Remember, that person has nothing to lose. You are the one doing the study. You are the one doing your master's and you have to try and finish. Okay. Then you also have a scenario in which they are hypothetical, conditional, trying to think that how do you think your life will change if you had nine children? Somebody has not even thought about five children. They are talking about nine children. So you are advisable to avoid questions such as this because they are very hypothetical in nature. Then questions that contain one more instruction, like a mathematical question. If you take your weekly income after tax and when you have made allowances for all regular bills, how much have you learned to go and spend? It will be better for you to ask how much do you, do you spend or how much do you have? And then you can work backwards in terms of what the person tells you so that you can use the, what you have received to do your calculation and evaluation of what, what should go, what, what could be the value you are looking for. Instead of you asking the person to do the calculation and putting the answer, you yourself can do it by asking the right question so that you can calculate it yourself and be able to say, okay, this is the issue. This is what I can say about the person. Okay. I would advise that don't put instructional questions so that the questionnaire then becomes like an, an assignment or homework. No, don't do that in your questionnaire. Okay. Good. Um, uh, you can leave for, I've actually finished. You can leave for your next lecture. That's my last slide. Structuring the question. We talked about this a little earlier. You should have your field notes section. You should have introduction of the research, demographics, the main questions, the other questions, and the conclusion. It's a similar thing as what we saw earlier. It's a similar thing as other questionnaires we saw earlier. Thank you very, very much. Those of you who want to do online survey, there's this website that says that can you survey monkey? Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. So next week, oh, next week we'll look into. I don't know what we're looking, but that will be our last lecture. Okay. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Okay, but I just want to draw your attention to the fact that you have um, next week, very likely, you may have your examination question. So just keep your, fing your, hands, your fingers and your hands and everything crossed. <laughs> you may have your examination question. And then when you go to Sakai, please note that you have your chapter six quiz also there. You have your chapter six quiz also there so that you can actually finish it. Your chapter six quiz also there. Okay, then. So thank you very much. And the session, today's session has, last week's session has been put there on Sakai already. Today's session two will be done. Today's session two will be done. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I don't think there are any more questions in here right now. Okay. So go to Sakai and then look at the chapter six questions. Which captures some of the things that we just did. Thank you very much. Okay. Where can you find the videos? Aaron, are you really asking this question? <laughs> it means that you have not been following all that we have been doing. Ask your friends, they'll tell you. When you go to Sakai, there's videos, a videos button you see there. Mm -hmm. Don't worry. So thank you very much. I, I, I leave you the grace of God that you shall have a great week, coming week. And you don't be worried about what. Don't be worried about what you may be facing. There may be, there is some great light at the end of the tunnel. 
and things will be better and things will be okay with you. I just want you to have confidence that there is a good, gracious God who is always looking after your affairs. No matter how much it seems impossible for you now, things will become possible sooner than you think. Mm. I leave you with the peace of God. Ryan, thank you. <laughs>